Uh, thanks to Zivon and uh, everybody on the Agile Adria volunteer list for uh, inviting me so many times. <laughs> 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 and thank you all for coming and thank you all for staying to the end. Um, how has the conference been for you? Yeah, pretty, you know, generally. Hello? A five. A five. Out of? Out of five. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you may have read the um, synopsis of what, what, what you're going to get for the next 45 minutes. Um, who here has seen the video or read anything by Simon Sinek? Yeah, one, two. Uh, well, he has a thing called the Golden Circle uh, where he explains how how to motivate people to buy products is kind of coming from marketing direction in that case. Um, and he says, start with the why. Why do you do a thing? Um, that's what people are really interested in. That's what people buy into. It's why you're making this product. It's not how you make it. It's not what its features are. It's why are you even bothering to sell it to the world at large? So I thought I'd start with the why because that's really for the last 20 years at least, um, been what's motivated me. Um, and what motivates me is I, over my career, I've gone into hundreds of different organizations, uh, most of them having their own software development function or group, generally within the IT group, a broader umbrella. And I see these people have a miserable time. You know, they're not allowed to... Um, exercise their creativity, or even if they're allowed to, there's other reasons why they don't. Um, they're not allowed to um, have fun. <laughs> in many cases, that's kind of frowned upon in business. You know, we're not here to have fun, we're here to make money. Um, and just generally, I've seen probably thousands of developers having a pretty sad time. And it's not just the developers, it's the managers as well. They're having a sad time too. Um, and everybody seems to be stuck in this cycle of just not really enjoying what they're doing. And given that um, work is half of our waking lives, a third of our lives in total, um, it seems to be pretty much a waste, and Lean talks about waste um, and, and reducing waste, um, amongst other things. So it really bugs me to see people having... Uh, a torrid time at work where with just a few simple changes, simple, I didn't say easy, <laughs> with a few simple changes, everybody could be having a better um, experience uh, every day in their working lives. So that's really kind of where I'm coming from. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning, um, gets me on a plane to Zagreb. Um, so it's about making things better and also, incidentally, because um, you mentioned uh, continuous improvement, it's about getting better at making things better. So we just, it's not just making things better one-off, like let's have a great Friday or let's have a great Tuesday afternoon. Uh, it's like, let's do something that will make it better for all time going forward. So sustainability is really an issue for me, and I have a lot of issues with both Agile and Lean around the sustainability of those approaches within organizations. They might seem to be fashionable and trendy now, even in the past when they weren't really mainstream, they seem to be uh, holding some promise in terms of uh, improving quality or making things faster or being more flexible, being able to respond as a business to business demands better. But when organizations have dipped their toe in the agile waters, often, uh, and even by like Jeff Sutherland's uh, admission, it can be 75% of organizations, um, they, they, they kind of pull back. They go, that water's a bit cold. <laughs> I, I don't want to go swimming in that. Uh, and then they go back to some other thing that they were doing before. Or maybe they try another fashionable thing. I'm not going to mention any names today. I'll get myself in trouble. <laughs> Okay, so um, just as a, a limbering up exercise, 
and uh, to give you ch folks a chance to uh, get involved. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like you all to stand up. Hang on a second. Uh, I'd like you all to stand up and just talk to the person next to you for two minutes on this one simple question. What is software development about? Why do we do software development? Is there anybody who doesn't understand the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you could uh, just stand up, talk to your neighbor about that for two minutes, and then, w or, <laughs> if you come to an answer sooner than two minutes, you just sit down. Again. When you're ready. <laughs> or more likely, not when you're ready now. <laughs> you're passionate about it. Yeah, oh, I, I would hope so. If you're at a conference, you hope that you're here because you um, are interested. <laughs> well, that, that seemed to uh, touch a nerve. That seemed to be an interesting question. Um, I'm not going to ask you for what you came up with because we're a bit short of time. But um, if you want to talk to me about that or anything else afterwards, I'm here for the rest of the evening until tomorrow morning. So I'm, I'm happy to have those kinds of conversations. In fact, that's why I come to conferences, to have conversations of that kind of nature. Um, I don't think there's any right answer, but there's an answer that I like to have posted in my head that... Uh, guides me in, in the work that I do. Uh, why do we do software development? Um, for me, setting aside the terminology, and we can talk about value or we can talk about um, products and those kinds of things, but at its heart, and you will see my cunning reason for using these words in a, in a few moments, um, I like to think that it's about attending to people's needs. That's what software does. It's what products do generally, and services for that matter. And software tends to be generally part of products or services. Um, of course, there are other reasons why we write software. We might write it for amusement, like we do a crossword puzzle, or we might write it for um, learning in our own time generally, um, because we want to get better at a particular language or a particular platform or something. But if we talk about business software or writing software in a business context, um, Ultimately, at the bottom line, for me, it's about meeting people's needs or addressing people's needs. There's a whole bunch of people out there who are essentially your customers or your prospective customers, and they have needs. And they're always trying to get their needs met. That's what people are like. People are need-seeking machines. <laughs> Actually, they're not machines. That's probably a bad analogy. But... There's a lot of uh, neuroscientific research these days uh, also going back into the realms of um, psychotherapy and psychology um, for the last 100 years at least um, that, that points us in the direction of being able to say that that's what people are about. People are about trying to get their needs met. Um, is there anybody who really takes issue with that as a, as a definition of what software development is about? No. Oh, one. Okay. Not oh, okay. I do think it's more wants as well. Uh, I think there are needs and wants. Yeah, I, I, I can use the words interchange. I'm happy to use the words interchangeably within this context. Yeah. Okay, so there's a bunch of uh, different arguments that business gurus have had about what business is about. Um, Drucker says it's uh, to create and keep a customer. How do you do that? By meeting their needs. Um, Goldratt says it's to make money, both now and in the future. Well, why are they going to give you money? Well, only if you, they think you're going to meet their needs. Maybe they're wrong about that. Coase <laughs> uh, had a slightly different take on it. He said it was to reduce coordination 
and economic transaction costs. That's why companies exist. Otherwise, we'd just be a network of individuals working with each other. And it's actually easier and cheaper to bring people together inside companies where the transaction costs are lower, um, or at least historically that's the case. Now, I think part of the change we're seeing in the world with um, flat armies, hierarchies, sociocracies, holacracies, um, and these different models of um, businesses, um, more or less, with more or less permeable boundaries, uh, we're seeing that some of the technologies that the world has invented now, particularly software, is bringing that, that, that assumption that it's cheaper to, for transaction costs to do stuff inside a business than it is to do it with an extended network of different small suppliers or individuals. We're seeing that as coming into question, but that's a topic for another day. Um, so for me, and this is where I'm going to talk about the antimatter principle, which is the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the headline for this talk. Um, let me just say that again, the antimatter principle. I'll explain why I call it that in a second. Um, but it's very simple, and just to give you a little bit of background. I've been influenced a lot by the great Jim Benson. Uh, everybody, everybody know Jim Benson here, more or less? Anybody not? familiar with Jim Benton and his work. Okay, he was the creator, along with Tony Ann, of uh, Personal Kanban. And Personal Kanban, I think one of its great strengths is it's just re it's reduced the whole question of how can I be productive as an individual um, to two, basically two principles. Make things visible and limit your working process. And those are the, just the two principles. So I was kind of... Oh, obviously, I've been thinking about the world of software development and why it's so broken for the last 25, 30 years. And uh, over that time, I've, I've come closer to something I'm happy with as, a, as an explanation of why it's so broken and also what to do about it. But um, I was looking some time ago for a, uh, a simple principle that people could use in any organization, in any business, in any context, really, where collaborative knowledge work is being done. And just like, like Jim's two principles, I was thinking, can I make it simple? Can I make it as simple as two principles? Actually, can I go the last yard and make it as simple as one principle? And that's where the antimatter principle came from. It was my attempt to give people a guiding principle that could um, just by itself, that's the only thing you really had to have focused in your head all the time you were working with other people, uh, which is, excuse my writing, <laughs> attend to folks' needs. Okay, now that sounds a bit radical, doesn't it, in most businesses? <laughs> Yeah, you might attend to the management's needs because they have the power and they'll be a bit upset if you don't. Um, in some more progressive companies, you might attend to the customer's needs if you're allowed to get in touch with them and find out what they really are. Um, but very rarely do we, we talk about developers' needs, workers' needs. Um, that's not really very trendy. And... Uh, Society at large, the, the needs of society within which the these companies and your organisations exist. Do we talk about society's needs and how the company might serve those wider needs? Again, a few companies have some kind of corporate social responsibility programme or something like that. Want to um, pretend they're green or maybe some few of them actually are green to some extent. Because greenness is only one set of needs that society might have. So this is the antimatter principle. And I'll just give you a little bit of a, a two-second rundown on where the, where, the, where the name came from, antimatter. Um, have you heard of the golden rule? 
Who here has heard of the golden rule? Yeah, not half a dozen people. Like that golden rule says, do unto other people as you'd like to be done unto. So if you'd like somebody to be polite to you when they're dealing with you, then be polite to them or just be polite to other people because what goes around comes around, basically. Now, that doesn't really work too well because people have different tastes, uh, as George Bernard Shaw pointed out. Um, so in the Agile community, um, more recently, there's the platinum rule, which is a little bit more valuable than gold. And the platinum rule says, do unto other people as they'd like you to do to them. So that actually involves talking to them and finding out what they'd like. So you can see we're, we're getting into this kind of territory now. Um, and why the antimatter principle? Well, I thought, what, what's, beyond the <coughs> excuse me, what's beyond the platinum rule? What's more valuable than platinum? And I went to Google and I found, asked Google the question, what's more valuable than platinum? <laughs> and it came up with a surprisingly short list of answers, which I can't remember most of them, but most of them were kind of strange, uh, rare earths and metals that people have never heard of. Um, and the only thing that kind of stuck out in that list to me was antimatter. Antimatter is very valuable. Um, they are making it now commercially so that you can go and buy some antimatter. I think it's sort of like $4 billion a gram or something. Um, maybe more than that, I can't remember. I, I posted the amount on my blog. Um, and NASA are thinking of using it. So it's, it's, it's not only valuable in a, in a financial sense, it's valuable in a um, oh, space exploration sense at least, because it's a very, very concentrated source of power. It's a great deal of energy in a very small mass. So NASA thinks it's going to be a great... Uh, fuel source for their deep space missions, if they can figure out how to use it and how to contain it and so on. Um, so coming back to, that's where the name basically came from. I, I liked the association, or associations. Any questions so far? Do, do feel free to ask questions as we go along. I hope to have some kind of conversation with you all, but we can do it in this session as much as we can do it outside. Right, so what are the general strategies that businesses use for attending to folks' needs? Okay, you, you may look, uh, it's quite fair to look blank at that question because <laughs> you can say, businesses attending to folks' needs, do they do that? <laughs> but I think they try because it's, it's human nature to try and attend to folks' needs. It's, we're pre-wired through hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to do this. Yeah, that's why I think it's kind of smart to piggyback on the back of that evolutionary pattern that we're all wired to and try and take advantage of it, try and use it to our advantage. So conventional businesses, of course, are doing things like um, command and control. You have people telling other people what to do. Um, you have hierarchies of management where you know, the big man tells the next level down what the plan is for the year, or maybe they work it out together. Um, and then that kind of filters down the organisation and everybody gets their little thing to be done. Um, typically, in most organisations, things get broken down into parts, which kind of follow that organisational structure, that organisational hierarchy, into business silos, you know, marketing, finance, IT. They all do their own little thing. Um, that's really not worked out too well for attending to folks' needs. It's been a strategy for making that happen, but it's really not been foremost in people's minds. Um, going back to the days of Taylor, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who kind of originated the corporate structure um, idea, he thought he was attending to folks' needs. Okay, it was a small subset of people, um, or maybe the people in those days had different needs. Um, he thought, certainly Ford, Henry Ford, was happy that he was giving lots of people work. He saw that as a social function. Um, there was lots of people 
who didn't have very many skills, who could actually go and work in these factories for rather large amounts of money compared to his competitors. Um, so you can see that some collection of actions and beliefs were coming together there to try and attend to people's needs of the time. I suspect people's needs have changed, but I also suspect that people generally being more educated, more liberal, um, in certain quarters of the world, of course, <laughs> um, have uh, their own needs at more at the forefront of their consciousness. Um, has anybody here seen or worked with the work of Giet Hofstede? Uh, he did a um, whole bunch of studies on IBM data back, or at least the, the data was back from the 60s, and he did a whole bunch of social studies on that. Uh, again, I'm not have time to get into that today, but if you're interested in how different business cultures differ around the world, um, Hofstede is probably a good place to start. More recently, of course, we've got the Agile Brigade. Um, and we think that, uh, I say we, I include myself tentatively, um, the Agile people think that if we have uh, autonomy, mastery and purpose, if we delegate to people and teams, if people have more self uh, ability or scope for self-organisation, then they can attend to their own needs better. And, and that will all work out better. And they're all the kind of um, principles and, and, and patterns from the Agile Manifesto kind of play into that space. It's about... It was coming from a developer's perspective, obviously. All the people who wrote it were developers. So they were trying to redress the balance, perhaps, in terms of getting their needs heard a little bit more and more generally getting the needs of developers around the world heard a little bit more within the corporate machine. Um, Lean, again, with its um, pillars, respect for people and continuous improvement, um, not least, are, again, the lean people are, are trying to attend to folks' needs. Um, typically, they'll put the customer a little bit more on a pedestal than, than the workers or even the management, but, again, there's that essence there of that perspective. Now... Why have I used these words and what do they mean? Well, I've written a bunch of stuff on my blog about explaining this in a little bit more detail. But attend means, well, we don't expect actually to get it right all the time. So I didn't say meeting folks' needs because that's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult finding out what they are. Even if you ask people what do you need, they're very rarely in a position to say, well, I, I need this and I need that. It's clear. It's always been the case. My life is centred around this and that. Um, very few people are able to articulate their needs. And even if they can articulate them, they might not be right. Um, it's a bit like software. Well, you, you, if, you, if you're in the software business, you know that if you, if you give people, um, or if you ask people what they want the software to do, then they'll say, oh, well, we need it to do this, and we need it to do that, and we need it to do the other, and then you give them the, the thing that does that, and they say, well, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> we thought we needed that, but we don't, and we thought that they needed that, but frankly, it's been a waste of time. Um, can we have some, a few other things? And so we don't expect to meet people's needs directly, but by attending to them, a whole bunch of stuff falls out. <coughs> and remember that what I was saying a little bit earlier about this being the guiding principle, the one thing that you need to remember Folks, I've already kind of expressed my view that that should be everybody. The management have needs. Uh, the owners of the company have needs. Uh, the workers, the customers, society, everybody. And what are needs? Where does this needs word come from? Well, we had a, we had a part of our software development process. I used to run a, a software house. Um, in fact, it was the first 100% agile software house in Europe. Um, back in the mid-90s, because we didn't call it Agile then, because the word hadn't been invented, or at least applied to that way of working. Um, and we used a part of our process, if you like, part of the way we did our work with different customers 
different clients, was we'd have a thing called table, tabular document, um, recording the conversations that we'd have with everybody involved in that pr project. Um, I, said, I said a dirty word there, I'm sorry. But <laughs> um, involved with that piece of work, uh, which was called stakeholders and their needs. And we'd, in a very informal way, record all the people that were, had something at stake from that piece of work, positively and negatively, and we'd try and get round and speak to all of them over time, not big upfront thing, it was like just when the opportunities presented themselves, and then we'd build up over time, hopefully just in time, before the development team needed the information, um, what their needs were from the work that we were doing for them. That sounds a bit like requirements gathering, and yes it was, but it was much less formal than that because we had some for more formal um, functional and non-functional requirements um, work that again got done iteratively, but that was traceable back to these stakeholders and their needs. So that we were pretty sure that we were doing what the people involved in the project thought they needed it to deliver. Of course, you know, again, we're not going to be absolutely certain, but at least having that in mind um, meant that we were doing less of the wrong thing and more of the right thing. And it's, a, it's really a numbers game. Okay, so the other place, the other reason for um, using the word needs is because of a thing called nonviolent communication. Um, now this has been big in my life for the last two years since I discovered it. It's given me a vocabulary in which to express um, how I felt about life and work and the world for a, <coughs> excuse me, for a long time, but I haven't had the, really the words or the structure uh, to, to, to contain it and to explain it to other people. Um, who here has heard of nonviolent communication? Mm, maybe 10, 5 or 10. Okay, um, who here has heard of Gandhi? Yeah, that's, uh, that's just about everybody. <laughs> And Martin Luther King. Okay, they're probably two of the standout celebrities in the non-violent world. And they were trying to change the world, as I think we all are, in our little small way, maybe. Um, and they took the conscious decision that it was more sensible to uh, follow a non-violent path towards change than it was to pursue like violent revolution with guns and bombs and all the nine yards of the terrorist uh, panoply. So nonviolent communication is a um, psychotherapy technique. It was originally invented by a chap called Marshall Rosenberg, who's an American psychologist, psychiatrist, psychotherapist. Um, and he invented it kind of like 50 years ago now. Um, to work with people who had psychological challenges, things that they w were not happy with in their lives that they wanted to fix. Um, there are still 400 odd different schools of psychotherapy, and this is just one of them, but it's the one that speaks to me most often. And I'm just going to explain the very core of nonviolent communication as a technique. And it's a technique for en that anybody can use when you're just talking with people. Um, it takes a bit of a practice to make it sound like normal speech. It can sound a bit stilted, a bit structured. But we start out with an observation, or maybe observations. What have you just seen, or what have I just heard um, what words have just been said that have caused me to, to focus on them? Like, uh, maybe you say to your kids, could you clean up your mess, please? <laughs> or maybe they say to you, can we go out for dinner? Or can we go down to McDonald's or whatever the local uh, kiddie attraction is? Um, 
So those are just, just the words. It's like what would be recorded by a camera or a, a, a microphone. When we see or hear something, we always have feelings. They trigger feelings. And, th and that's how we respond, emotionally at least, internally. We may hold our tongue and not get into like causing some trouble by saying something back directly. But as soon as we hear or see something, the chances are we're going to have some feelings about it. Maybe good feelings. They may be, yeah, let's go as a family and let's go and have a family meal out somewhere. Or they may be, oh no, no, it's going to be a disaster. It was a disaster last time and I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> Let's, let's try and um, deflect them from that idea. But whatever it is, there's, there's going to be some feelings associated with that, um, those observations. Where do those feelings come from? They come from needs. We feel how we feel about what we hear or see or experience because we have needs which we're trying to get met. And some of the things that we hear or see may tell us through our feelings that our needs are going to get met and then we're going to feel positive about those kinds of things. Or conversely, maybe, um, they, the words we hear are going to t be telling us through our feelings that some of our needs are not going to get met. Darling, do I look big in this? Okay, we're going to have some feelings about that kind of qu question. <laughs> and what needs are kind of underlying that? Well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> well, maybe I, maybe I will go there just briefly and say, well, <laughs> probably um, the wife or the girlfriend that might be saying that would be looking for some reassurance about her attractiveness to you as a man. I don't know. Actually, it's not, a condition, it's not a situation I've ever faced myself. <laughs> Nobody has ever asked me that question. Maybe they had more sense. <laughs> or maybe they just knew that I'd come back with something pithy. Um, right. So these are three of the four steps of nonviolent communication. And these are just four steps. So it's really kind of a very simple technique. Ha, I didn't say easy. Um, and the, the fourth one is a request. A concrete, actionable, and refusable request. So if somebody, somebody might say, um, how about we go out for dinner? And then you'll feel, say you feel positive about that um, because uh, you, you, know, you feel romantic and you have a need to be close to that person in a romantic setting. And then you'll maybe make a request. Say, yeah, how about would you be willing to go to this restaurant because we haven't tried it before? And that would be nice because that would meet my, so another need that I have for a bit, of, a bit of a change of scenery or a bit of a excitement or whatever. So that is nonviolent communication. And you can use that in any situation. You can use it in work situations, you can use it in meetings, you can use it when you're talking to customers about their needs. <coughs> It takes a bit of practice to get the hang of. I mean, I've been practicing it for two years and I still declare myself a novice. Um, if you're interested in this as a technique, then there's a whole bunch of um, resources, literature. There are five or six books by Marshall Rosenberg himself. There's probably an equal number of books by other people on the same subject, some specifically applying it to business and business context. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I've written over the last two years applying it to software development and that context. Um, there's a whole bunch of Marshall Rosenberg videos on YouTube which are really great because he uses these sock puppets. <laughs> um, and not with kids, um, but he uses the giraffe and the jackal to illustrate um, the two different modes of speech that us humans typically find ourselves using. Giraffe speaking from the heart because it happens to be the land animal with the biggest heart, and the jackal speaking um, rather less kindly than that, <laughs> um, which is what we find ourselves... We, there's a lot of jackal language that goes on in organisations. 
I need you to do this by next Tuesday. That's jackal language, and by the definition of violence that it comes with non-violent communication, that is a violent kind of statement. It's, you don't have any choice. There's implicit threats there about um, if you don't do it by next Tuesday, you might not have a job. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up with the way we talk to each other in workplaces. And coming back to attending to folks' needs, this, is, this again is where it, where it kind of pops out. There's one other step that nonviolent communication doesn't really include in this list, but I like to mention it, and I call it step zero. Um, which is empathy, and whereas if two people um, are practicing nonviolent communication together, and again there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos on people doing that which are really kind of educational and interesting, um, if only one of you is, is practicing nonviolent communication or trying to in a, in a situation, which is typically what's going to happen in the workplace because the other people won't have heard of it even, um, you have to earn the right to use this four-step approach. You can't just jump straight into it because people just think you're weird. Like you're probably thinking I'm weird at the moment, um, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, but empathy is, is your gateway into the world of nonviolent communication. Actually, empathy is your gateway into the world of being human because if we can have empathy with each other, or for each other, then we get off on the right foot, so to speak, in terms of forming a, a humane relationship. Right. I'm conscious of the time. How much longer have we got? Five minutes, right. The antimatter principle is not a moralistic principle. I, haven't, I don't put it forward because it's the right thing to do, because it's humane, or because it's um, ethically a sound principle. I like to think it meets all those criteria, but actually, I put it forward because it plays into what we're trying to do in knowledge work industries. We're trying to get the best out of people, we're trying to get people to collaborate effectively, we're trying to get people to use their brains creatively and productively without any kind of blocks from stress and aggravation and violence. Violence causes a lot of um, pushback, passive aggressiveness, and all the kind of things that come with people trying to tell you to do something. You know, if, somebody try, if somebody tells you to go and do something, what's the first thing you feel? Bugger that. <laughs> I ain't doing that. If you ask me nicely, I might have considered it, but now you just told me to go and do it. No way. You may not be in a position to actually say that. <laughs> it may be career-threatening, but that's probably how you feel about it, because it conflicts with some of your needs. Right, so it's, the antimatter principle is not meant to be a moralistic, coming from a moralistic standpoint. It's meant to be coming from a practical standpoint, because it plays to the way that we're wired as human beings. And the key thing that drives it is to tend to everybody's needs, yourself and all the other people at the same time, is because lots and lots of research has shown us that the one thing that drives people more than anything in terms of motivation, intrinsic motivation, and we heard somebody mention Dan Pink earlier today, that was Rachel, um, the one thing that drives people towards intrinsic motivation or enables intrinsic motivation is the joy you get from helping others. Is there anybody here, would you like to just think about for a second, some occasion where, you, just out of the blue, you've helped a stranger? And what you felt, what kind of joy you felt, maybe joy, may not always, but um, on those occasions when it turned out well, <laughs> the joy you felt from actually doing that, just helping somebody that, that had no connection to you, you had no st flesh in the game, you had no stake in it, but you just did it anyway, and then felt joy, because it was a connection between two human people, <coughs> excuse me, two human beings. 
And that's what this principle, that's where it comes from. It comes from that ingrained, hard, pre-wired um, impetus that we all have within us to help other people get their needs met. And if we're helping other people get their needs met, we're feeling joy for doing that, but then also reciprocally, because that's another hardwired human um, motivation, reciprocation, doing things for, that other people do for you, um, they will then most likely, unless they're the 6% of the population that are sociopaths, um, they will get joy out of helping you. And it's, it, it's kind of like a, a virtuous circle. And if you can build that in an organisation, you don't really need to worry about practices, skills, experience, because that'll all come along when people are helping each other. Right, for the last minute, and overrunning only slightly, um, I'd like to just have you spend, in groups of two and three, five, say five minutes, just thinking about or discussing how you might take this principle back into your workplace and what kind of result, what kind of things might happen if you did that. So five minutes on that. Groups of three or four. And then we'll come back to a, a, a finish up, a wrap up at the end. Take it away as a topic and, and, and discuss it amongst yourselves uh, for as long as you like, basically. Although implementing it would be nice as well. Um, just to close, I'd like to say thank you very much for your participation and your attention. Um, and I'd, leave you, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Marshall Rosenberg, who is probably one of my biggest heroes these days. Um, He's talking about um, whether nonviolent communication actually makes any difference. Um, whether if, if we use it, it'll actually trigger any changes in our lives, in our organisations. I'm not saying that this always happens quickly, having a result. I do maintain, however, that compassion inevitably blossoms when we stay true to the principles and process of NVC. And that's really what it's about. It's, uh, if you stick at it, then amazing changes can happen. And some of those amazing changes are, uh, are documented in his books and his videos. But uh, you'll only really know if, if and when you start using it in your own lives. I can attest to the changes that it's made in mine. Thank you. <laughs>